Uh, in this video, I'm going to try to walk through what I've learned about this rickshaw and how it's wired up and how it works. And um, hopefully um, you have a good spirit of tinkering uh, because this is definitely a tinkerer's dream. Um, Poppy, who put it together, was a brilliant engineering mind and he built uh, a lot of this from scratch and he was very, uh, had a lot of ingenuity and he was very, um, what's the right word, creative with the different things that he did. So, first of all, underneath the seat, which you can raise up here, there's a battery. Now, I just replaced this battery like two days ago from batteries plus bulbs. Um, we hadn't uh, finished learning how it works, so we, we ran the battery down a little bit from starting it so many times. We're going to try to charge that back up. Um, so I have a battery pack over here that I've been jumping off the battery to get it going. I don't think it went low enough to damage the battery as much as it's just a little low. All right, and so next up is under the floorboard here. You just lift up under this carpet. There's a flap here. Now it's useful to have something to wedge here. Watch out, there are sharp screws. Um, this wasn't a polished product as much as it was something uh, Poppy put together that worked. And um, anybody familiar with small engines probably knows more about what they're seeing here than I do. But what I've learned is um, this is the air filter. If you remove that, you can, uh, when I was troubleshooting it, yeah, it's okay. Uh, when I was troubleshooting it, we prayed, sprayed a little starting fluid in there just to get the engine running the first time, and now it's running pretty good. We drained all the gas from the gas tank. We took the gas tank off. Um, I took the carburetor off and cleaned it uh, with spray carburetor cleaner. I didn't really need to soak it. It was actually pretty clean, so I just sprayed it out a little bit, put it back on there. Um, the, the most interesting thing under here is the throttle assembly, which is very unusual. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on with the mechanism here, but essentially this cable is the throttle cable. And when you twist the hand grip, you can see it pulls the throttle. And you'll notice there's not a spring holding it in tension to put the throttle back to idle. And that's for two reasons. If you pull this all the way back to idle, then the um, engine will stall because the throttle linkage underneath the gas tank is the wrong length. So if you had, it's actually a, a small wire. You could probably wire it up with a, uh, a paper clip or something to change the, the geometry there and make it work. And then the other reason is um, whatever spring, the only spring that, that I have to hold it down is too strong and then your hand gets tired holding the throttle open while you're driving. Um, but in practice, it's, it's, a, it's such a slow thing. And if you wiggle the throttle a little bit, that's actually about where idle is. Um, it takes very little uh, to go from idle to running on this. And in this section, I'm going to go over the controls that are up here under the seat. Um, well, I guess we'll start off with this one where we just left off. This is the throttle, so it's just a piece of an, you know, an old gear shift from a mountain bike or something. Um, and that actuates the throttle, which we showed you under the floorboard there. Um, this is the starter, so it is, uh, the engine does have an electric starter on it. This uh, turns on the engine circuit so it can run, and this turns on the starter circuit so the starter could be powered. Once the starter circuit is on, the light will come on and that'll let you know that it's ready to start, and you turn the key to actually engage the starter a lot like a car. After it's started, you can flip this switch down so there's no more power going to the starter and you can keep running it. And then when you're ready to turn it off, just turn the key all the way off and that'll turn the engine off. Um, right here, this is labeled throttle and it has a position called run, and so both of those labels are wrong and confusing. This is actually the choke and the choke is open, meaning you're ready to run when the when it's in this position. If you wanna choke and you know close the choke for a cold start, then you actually move it all the way down into the run position, and that's actually closing the choke off there, which makes it good for a cold start. And then once it starts running a little bit, you can start to open up the choke, and then when you're driving it around, you'll keep the choke all the way open. And then this under here is the brake. It's a foot brake. It is drum, ba drum brakes on the rear, and it's got a solid linkage. You can see this welded rod here. Um, it can be adjusted with um, uh, by turning this. I will just put a screwdriver or some other thin little metal rod in there, and then as you twist this, you can either lengthen it or shorten it, and that is the adjustment for the brakes. Um, there's a nut there to kind of remind you where you were if you need to take it apart. Um, the foot brake, when you press down on it, it puts the brake on, and then this lever can kind of hold it there. So once you put it down, you can lock it in place with the lever. So as I mentioned before, it does have an electric starter, which we're going to try to use here in a minute and show you how that goes. Um, but there's also a pull start under here um, as a backup. So 
uh, if the battery does die, you can pull start it. And uh, just for fun, I'm actually going to try to pull start it right now. So I'm going to turn the key into the on position, but I'm not going to bother powering up the starter itself. And then I'm just going to try pulling and see what we get. We'll go ahead and close off the choke, as I mentioned earlier, give it a tiny bit of throttle and give it another shot. One last thing I wanted to cover before we start it up and give it a test drive is uh, there is a bell on it. And I haven't been able to get the bell to actually ring, but there there is a linkage here which changes the angle of the bell. So I think somebody who um, took some time to tinker with it and take a look at it can probably figure out what Poppy was trying to do so that you can get a bell that dings uh, when it drives, but I can't get it to ding yet. We're going to try the electric start. As I said, the battery is a little low. We'll try to charge it up. Um, but uh, if not, we have a starter pack. But as I showed you before, we've got the pull start. So I'm going to try the electric start. Hi. If it works, we'll just drive away. And if it doesn't work, I'll do the pull start. So first up, get the brake. Second, we're going to keep the choke closed. Turn the starter circuit on. OK, yep, not enough power for the starter to work right now. So we'll just turn the starter circuit off. And I will do a pull start. One thing I wanted to mention, I showed you how the choke works and how it's labeled throttle. Um, you, if you follow the cable for the choke down, you'll see it's connected to one of two levers in the engine. The choke is the lever on top, and the lever on bottom controls whether the fuel is getting to the carburetor. So um, if you're familiar with uh, motorcycles or other small engines, oftentimes there'll be something called a petcock, which turns off the fuel at the tank. This doesn't have a petcock. The fuel is always waiting right outside the carburetor, and that's where you can turn it off so that the carburetor um, won't be resting with fuel in it. So when we turned it off just now, we turned the fuel off and we just let it run until it used all the rest of the fuel in the carburetor in an attempt to try to keep it from gumming anything up. One last note about the tires on this rickshaw. Um, they are commonly referred to as 650B. Um, if you look at the markings on the front tire, you'll see that it says 26 by one and a half, and the one and a half is written as a fraction. It's one space one slash two instead of 1.5, and that actually denotes that the, the inner diameter of the tire itself is um, uh, larger than a standard 26 by 1.5. Um, so I went down a huge rabbit hole I had no idea before that bicycle tires have many different sizing standards. Um, and so we put, um, uh, we put the one point or the one and a half inch tire on here, but you could get a wider tire. If it's 650 B that's generally de denoting that the, that'll actually fit on this rim. Um, on the rear, we actually put 650 B's and they are wider and I like the wider tire. Um, and you could put a wide one like that on the front as well. Um, if, uh, 
if you follow, there's also another standard, which I think is more comprehensive, called the ISO standard, and it has another name. It's like ESTR, I think, which is like European Standard of Tire Rating or something like that. Um, if you follow that, the number that you care about is 584. And so you, this is a 40. 584 and on the back it is a 52 584 and the first number the 40 and the 52 is how wide the tire is and the 584 is that inner diameter which is the thing you actually care about so as long as you buy a 584 it'll fit or a 650b it should fit a st if you go to walmart and just buy a 26 inch mountain bike tire i don't think it would work because uh we had a tire that we think we that came from walmart and it didn't fit over the rim so in case you're looking at that, just look for the, the marking there that says 40584, 50584, 52584, and that'll, uh, if you find one with the same ISO code, it'll work.